Okay, uh, let me start first of all by briefly acknowledging the Kadigal people of the Eora Nation. And because this is a humanist society, I'm also going to acknowledge the Australopithecines of the African savannah because they are the elders of all humanity. Okay. Um, to explore the meaning and the role of justice as it pertains to humanism, the first thing I need is a definition of humanism. And where better to find one than on the Humanist International website? The definition is humanism is a democratic and ethical life stance that affirms that human beings have the right and responsibility to give meaning and shape to their own lives. Humanism stands for the building of a more humane society through an ethics based on humans, uh, human and other natural values in a spirit of reason and free inquiry through human capabilities. Humanism is not theistic and it does not accept supernatural views of reality. That's quite a mouthful. There's a lot in this, plenty of ethics, rights, responsibilities, and human values, but I note that there is no mention of justice. So I looked a little further and found that humanism includes all these things. In short, it says something like this. Humanism recognizes that humans are the most capable curators of knowledge in the known universe, Humans are the most sophisticated moral ethical actors on the earth. Humans find value in themselves and each other. And humans create their own meaning without appeal to divine plan or purpose. Now, that sounds reasonable enough, but maybe it's because I'm not a card carrying humanist. I have quite a bit of trouble recognizing these things. Because as I see it, humans recognize themselves as the most knowledgeable, only because they define what it means to be knowledgeable in terms of what they themselves know. That sounds a bit circular, then that's because it is. If other things don't know what we know, we simply don't regard them as knowledgeable. Second, humans are the most sophisticated moralizing actors on earth. We spend a lot of time doing that, but they're a long way from being moral. If they were, there'd be no need for justice, ethics, or even humanism. Third, the humans find that, that humans find value in themselves is more a vice than a virtue. It is human self-importance that has led to all the problems of the Anthropocene, from mass extinctions to global warming. And finally, creating their own meaning is what makes humans so utterly self-interested, and it may eventually be the cause of their demise. These difficulties aside, I note that there are many reference, references to morals, ethics, and values on the humanist website but there's still no mention of justice. Nor is, nor is justice mentioned uh, in the Amsterdam Declaration, uh, which, which was the, uh, a meeting in 2002 of, of the world's humanists. And uh, uh, although it does provide a comprehensive list of humanism's foundational principles, there's ethics, rationality, democracy, human rights, personal liberty, social responsibility, knowledge, personal development, and a life stance of maximum fulfillment. There it is, maximum fulfillment. There's that self-interested self-importance again. The Humanist Society of New South Wales has a Facebook page, and it also characterizes humanism in considerable detail. Here I learned that humanism and the society is engaged in these things the defense and promotion uh, and, and extension of enlightenment values. While many of these principles imply, uh, are implied by the concept of justice, there's still no specific mention of the term. I still can't find justice. So next I turn to the New South Wales Humanist website where I found, where I found this definition down here in the green. It says this, I won't read it but, it, but it's all here, all the same stuff. It's all there in detail. We've got rational philosophy, uh, dignity, um, individual liberty, social and planetary responsibility, democracy, an open society and human rights 
and social justice. Oh, at last, I found a reference to justice, or at least I found a reference to social justice. As an aside, I note that the, there are no less than 12 anti-religious references on this one web page. This reveals something about the history of humanism. It was originally a revolt against the church back at the Renaissance. And if this web page is any, gu any guide, then it's still revolting. However, I also found this. David Tribe, one of Australia's leading humanists, enthusiastically promoted on the website, wrote, that in 19, wrote in 1972 that in everyday matters of tolerance, balanced judgment, truthfulness, trustworthiness, and the rest, he was unable to see that humanists were any better than anyone else. So it seems, just like everyone else, humanists enthusiastically advocate a raft of lofty ideals and then don't practice what they preach. According to David Tribe, humanists are rather more concerned with their godlessness than they are with their own moral fiber. Setting all this aside, it seems to me that humanism stands on these four pillars. The rejection of supernaturalism in all its forms, the assumption of human rationality, the assumption of human agency, and the assumption of human responsibility. Now, you've got to like that. There's nothing wrong with that. However, I think the rejection of, of supernaturalism is straightforward enough, as is accepting the assumption of human responsibility, purely on the grounds that whatever we did, ultimately we are the ones who did it. However, human rationality and human agency are rather more problematic. The Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman has found that humans are rational only about things that don't matter very much. When it does matter, irrational gut feelings and emotions are the primary drivers of human behavior. As he says, humans are not well described by the rational agent model. And according to uh, neuroscientist Robert Sapolsky, we have no meaningful agency either. We are autonomous, yes, we are that, but we are not agents. This is an important distinction. Unfortunately, I don't have time to delve into it here. That would take a whole other talk. Okay, so far it seems that equity, human rights, accountability, and so on are important elements of humanism, but justice itself is not. This is unsurprising because justice simply is all these things. It isn't a separate thing in itself. Justice is nothing on its own, Rather, it is the implementation of moral principles. It's the moral principles that define what justice is, and justice is just a collective term. So let me see if I can now define justice. The concept of justice goes back to at least Plato. In his Republic, in Book 4, justice is one of four cardinal virtues, alongside prudence, temperance, and fortitude. The term cardinal comes from the Latin, carto meaning hinge, because it is on these four hinges that a virtuous life is supposed to swing. Together, the four virtues constitute wisdom and form Plato's virtue theory of ethics. There's some overlap between the four, but basically prudence is about caution, discretion, and self-discipline. Temperance is about moderation and self-control. Fortitude is courage and strength. And justice is, uh, well, it's complicated. We'll get to that shortly. Yeah. The cardinal virtues appear again in the Book of Wisdom of Solomon, written about 150 BC, and later again in the fourth book of Maccabees. And it is from these sources that Catholic moral theology drew its ideas about virtue. So that's the history side of, of, of the origin of justice, but it doesn't tell us what justice is. Ultimately, I suppose justice is just about moral correctness. In the philosophical literature, it's usually defined or at least described in terms of all these things, morality, goodness, honesty, integrity, the list goes on. I won't attempt to define all these terms. I'd be here forever. Rather, I'll take a much simpler approach and just say that justice is somehow concerned with right and wrong. 
That way, all we need to do is establish what we mean by right and wrong. Ultimately, right and wrong are just about what we and others like. It's really not much more complicated than that, despite the mountains of stuff that philosophers have written about it. And it's mostly a numbers game. The question of whether we like things because they're right or we think they're right because we like them is something we can discuss later. Philosophy and neuroscience take opposite views on this. In any case, we regard as right those events or circumstances that we like or prefer and that most others are prepared to at least tolerate. If everyone likes something and prefers it to alternatives, then it is automatically right. It doesn't get any better than that. Everybody likes it. And even if only most people like it, then it's still all right. For those, uh, and for those who don't like it, well, we either decide that they're just wrong or that it's just too bad for them. Similarly, we regard as wrong those events and circumstances that we and or most others don't like. If it's something nobody likes, then it's automatically wrong. In practice, this seldom happens. There's always going to be someone who likes it, but that's too bad for us. In most other people, uh, in, if most other people don't like something, but we do, then there's trouble. They think we're wrong and we think they're wrong. We obviously think it's right. After all, if we thought it was wrong, then we wouldn't like it either. So in this case, we get upset. There's usually an argument, possibly a fight, maybe even a war, and then it becomes a numbers game because might is right, the law of the jungle, and the stronger side wins. If nobody likes it except us, then there's either something wrong with us or something wrong with the world. And either way, we either get depressed or throw a tantrum. But this is, not a, this is not enough. For something to be wrong, it also has to be something that we think could have been avoided or done otherwise. After all, if something is inevitable, if it's something no one could have done anything about, then although we may not like it, we wouldn't say it was wrong. Consider, for example, volcanic eruptions or cyclones or, or even rain on picnic day. We certainly don't like these things, but we don't think they're wrong. Justice is about right and wrong. It's not about good and bad. Justice is also about fairness. The logic of deciding fairness is much the same as it is for right and wrong. Something is, is, is fair when, pe when, when people think it's equitable, even-handed and impartial or unbiased. Otherwise, it is unjust or unfair or at least less than fair. Justice defined as fairness also means giving each person his or her due, what he or she deserves. And hence we get derivative notions of justice, such as meritocratic justice, distributive justice, and restorative justice. And fairness is all that these kinds of justice are about. Consider how if everything were perfectly fair, there would be nothing to re redistribute there'd be nothing to compensate or restore, and there would be no need for justice. Of course, we would still have to decide exactly what it is that is fair and equitable. That's a subject of never-ending debate. But we do draw on notions of fairness, whatever they are, to determine what people deserve. But we also have another problem. What is just, as in right and proper, and what is just, as in fair and equitable, are often not the same thing. In fact, they're often not even closely aligned. For example, if a penniless mother steals some bread to feed her starving child, it might be just or proper to reprimand her, but would it really be fair? Alternatively, it might be fair to let her have the bread, but when she returns every day and steals another loaf, would it still be right to leave her subsequent thefts unpunished? It turns out that how we answer these questions depends on who we are. The Irish psychologist Nona Lyons found that women feel more connected to others and that 63% of them prioritise fairness over rightness. By contrast, men feel independent and more individualistic and 79% of them prioritise rightness over fairness. So in our example of the penniless mother, 
The outcome depends critically on whether the local magistrate is male or female. And as Stanford neurologist Robert Sapolsky points out, it also depends on whether she's a liberal or a conservative. Sapolsky explains all this in his book called Behave. The neuroscientific explanations are too complicated to go into here, but they have to do with brain wiring, neurotransmitters, and what kind of childhood we had. Sapolsky also asks, are moral judgments the product of reasoning or emotion? And his research clearly shows that the answer is not reasoning. This may or may not come as a surprise, but the fact is, as Kahneman also points out, that people mostly don't act as they reason. And hence, moral reasoning is a poor predictor of moral action. People don't do what they think. Here's a practical demonstration of this from Michael Sandel, a professor of government policy at Harvard. In 2005, he gave a series of lectures on justice, which I can highly recommend. They're excellent. They're all online. And so far, they've been viewed by over 14 million people. Here's Professor Sandel in his first lecture demonstrating that moral action does not follow moral reasoning. Suppose you're the driver of a trolley car and your trolley car is hurtling down the track at 60 miles an hour. And at the end of the track, you notice five workers working on the track. You try to stop, but you can't. Your brakes don't work. You feel desperate because you know that if you crash into these five workers, they will all die. Let's assume you know that for sure. And so you feel helpless until you notice that there is off to the right, a side track. And at the end of that track, there's one worker working on the track. Your steering wheel works. So you can turn the trolley car, if you want to, onto the side track, killing the one, but sparing the five. Here's our first question. What's the right thing to do? What would you do? Let's take a poll. How many would turn the trolley car onto the side track? Raise your hand. How many wouldn't? How many would go straight ahead? Keep your hands up, those of you who would go straight ahead. A handful of people would. The vast majority would turn. Let's hear first. Now we need to begin to investigate the reasons why you think it's the right thing to do. Let's begin with those in the majority who would turn to go onto the side track. Why would you do it? What would be your reason? Who's willing to volunteer a reason? Go ahead, stand up. Um, because it, it can't be right to kill five people when you can only kill one person instead. It wouldn't be right to kill five if you could kill one person instead. That's a good reason. That's a good reason. Who else? Does everybody agree with that reason? Go ahead. Um, well, I was thinking it's the same reason on 9-11 um, with regard to people who, who flew the plane into the uh, Pennsylvania field as heroes because they chose to kill the people in the plane and not uh, kill more people in uh, big buildings. So the principle there was the same on 9-11. It's a tragic circumstance, but better to kill one and so that five can live. Is that the reason most of you had those of you who would turn? Yes. Let's hear now from those in the minority, those who wouldn't turn Yes. Well, uh, I think that's the same type of mentality that justifies genocide and totalitarianism. In order to say, save one type of race, you wipe out the other. So what would you do in this case? You would, to avoid the horrors of genocide, you would crash into the five and kill them? Presumably, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, who else? 
That's a brave answer. Thank you. Let's consider another trolley car case and see whether those of you in the majority want to adhere to the principle better that one should die so that five should live. This time, you're not the driver of the trolley car, you're an onlooker. You're standing on a bridge overlooking a trolley car track. And down the track comes a trolley car. At the end of the track are five workers. The brakes don't work. The trolley car is about to careen into the five and kill them. And now you're not the driver. You really feel helpless until you notice standing next to you, leaning over the bridge is a very fat man. And you could give him a shove. He would fall over the bridge, onto the track, right in the way of the trolley car. He would die, but he would spare the five. Now, how many would push the fat man over the bridge? Raise your hand. How many wouldn't? Most people wouldn't. Here's the obvious question. What became of the principle? Better to save five lives, even if it means sacrifice one. What became of the principle that almost everyone endorsed in the first case? So, so there you are. Uh, moral action doesn't always track moral reasoning. There are, in fact, hundreds or perhaps thousands of different scenarios of this trolley problem that show that our moral reasoning is completely inconsistent. But that doesn't mean that there's any shortage of moral reasoning. In fact, we could spend forever analyzing the literature. There's Aristotle's theory that equals should be treated equally. There's John Locke's theory of natural law. There's Thomas Hobbes and Jean-Jacques Rousseau's theories of social contract. There's Jeremy Bentham's and John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism. There's Robert Nozick's theory of personal rights and property rights. And for example, there's John Rawls's theory of fairness and his veil of ignorance. Now, Rawls advocates a, uh, uh, a, a maximum of personal freedom. And he also advocates a fair and equitable distribution of goods and rights, however they might be defined. But there's the rub, for there is no single distribution that would satisfy everyone. It's human nature to want more than one's fair share. Just look at the way people are currently hoarding toilet paper. I think there's little value in theorizing, in, in all this theorizing. To me, it's all post hoc rationalization and not particularly representative of what real people actually want or do. As one time Chalice Professor of Philosophy at the University of Sydney, John Mackey observed, he said, there are no objective values. Like rightness and wrongness, it's just what we like. And people are individuals, they are different, and they all like different things to different extents. And this is only half the story. A second definition of justice is that it is concerned with the righting of wrongs, the righting of what we might call injustices. On this interpretation, if there's nothing wrong, then there's nothing for justice to do. In practice, I don't think we need to worry. It seems there'll be plenty for justice to do far into the future. This is also an empty definition, uh, just as before. It's a kind of placeholder or label. For to be at all meaningful, it needs to be qualified by some or other list of wrongs to be righted. And qualified by different lists of wrongs, it takes on completely different meanings. But even a list of wrongs to be righted is not enough. For to be able to right them, we, we, we must first decide what it is that they should be righted to. 
And then we need to decide how we might go about writing them, who is to be charged with writing them, and also how to avoid causing other wrongs along the way, so-called unintended consequences or collateral damage. These questions are not new. We've been grappling with them for thousands of years, and we continue to be confronted with them every single day. You may recognize them as aspects of a deeper underlying question, perhaps the biggest question of them all, which is, how are we to live? In this way, these questions don't just lie at the core of justice and jurisprudence, which is the philosophy of law, they form the basis of all morality, ethics, and social and political theory. And like ethics and social and political theories, justice is a two-step process. There's the business of working out what's right, and then the business of righting wrongs. Somewhat obviously, we need to do the first before we can reasonably try the second. Doing it the other way around leads us only to change wrongs into other wrongs. More difficulties arise as soon as we realize that there is more than one answer to each of these questions. Every situation is different, all people are different, and they don't all want to live in exactly the same way. So tensions and conflicts will constantly arise. Hence the world is a vastly complex system with very many different moving parts, somewhat like a giant kaleidoscope. It goes round and around, always changing, never the same, but also never really different. And there's never any guarantee that future pictures will be any prettier than previous ones. It is no accident, therefore, that despite everyone's best efforts, the imperfect world that we see around us today is the best that we have been able to achieve. There's a lesson in this somewhere for philosophers, legal theorists, and even for the most ardent humanists. So to summarize, justice is about right and wrong, fair and unfair, and the righting of wrongs. These are not all exactly the same thing, of course, which is why there are different aspects of justice. There's distributive justice, which is about the impartial distribution of goods. There's redistributive justice, which is rebalancing that distribution. There's restorative justice, reestablishing some former status quo. There's retributive justice, which is what is making justice appear to be done. There's social justice, balancing individual and collective rights, and more, many more. We need them all, and we always will. Here's one more reason why. Bruce Bogosian is professor of mathematics at Tufts University. He showed that far from wealth trickling down to the poor, the natural inclination of wealth in free market economies is to flow upwards. Well, we all suspected this, but now there's formal mathematical proof. I won't give you all the mathematics here. Suffice it to say that of the 14 countries in the graph served by the European Central Bank, all except the Netherlands are slightly oligarchic. They're on the trickle up side of equilibrium where wealth is condensing upwards, but only slightly, maybe because when inequality increases too far and oligarchies begin to form, political pressures are brought to bear to prevent the further reduction of inequality. So what this means is that if you're an advocate of free market economics, free of government intervention, then you have to be very careful what you wish for. Justice and fairness are not the natural default. Here's one final example of how justice does and doesn't work. Professor Shai Danzinger is a cognitive neuroscientist now at the University of Sydney Business School. Back in 2011, when he was at the Ben-Gurion University in Israel, he and his colleagues followed eight Jewish-Israeli parole judges presiding over two different parole boards for 10 months and analyzed their judicial rulings regarding parole for 1,112 prisoners. In their analysis, they sorted the judgments every which way looking for judicial bias. They didn't find any, which was excellent news, but they did find something else, which was quite remarkable. The judges reviewed around 36 cases per day, 
of the three two-hour sessions, early morning, late morning, and afternoon. And when parole applications were sorted in order of daily case number, this is the pattern of judgments that emerged. The first case in each session was granted parole over 65% of the time, while the last case in each session was granted parole only less than 10% of the time. All other variables were random. Clearly no one thought of this at the time, but the reason for the discrepancy is well known. The judgments varied by the judge's blood glucose level. The judges worked very hard, and by the end of each session, they were tired and hungry. They did not consider later cases with as much care as earlier ones, and mostly made the easier, safer decision, which was not to grant parole. After a meal and a rest, their blood glucose levels were restored, and their deliberations returned to their former level. Note, however, that in the afternoon session, after a full morning's work, the rate of decline was much faster than in the morning sessions. The effect has been reproduced many times in the laboratory. It's easy to do. Test the moral inclinations of a group of people by giving them a quiz containing some difficult moral conundrums, and then let them have a break. During the break, give half the people a sweet snack and give the other half a difficult maths test. Then bring everyone together again and give them another quiz to test their moral inclinations. In every case, we get the predicted result. The people who had the snack become more empathic and considerate, while the people who did the math test become more dogmatic and judgmental. As an aside, I personally take advantage of knowing this result. When I go to the dentist, I make sure that my appointment is the first one straight after the dentist had his lunch. So there you have it. We all want justice, we all want things to be right and fair, but we each want something a little different. We all know what's right for us and we try and prevent others from doing things we don't like. If we happen to be in power, we enact laws to impose our views. For example, why else would a government outlaw homosexual relations between consenting adults? It's been done in 74 countries. And we do it all mostly because it makes us feel better. And it's utterly subjective. Everyone's sense of justice and fairness is different, and it changes by the hour, depending on how tired and grumpy they are. You and I are no exception. We don't notice it in ourselves, but our moral standards go up and down like a yo-yo. Ultimately, what people think is just and fair depends on a wide array of extraneous factors. It depends on who we are. It depends on whether our psychological disposition is male or female. It depends whether we are liberal or conservative. It depends on our genes, our upbringing, and even when we had our last meal. That's how variable justice is. It means something different for each of us, and we ourselves don't always act in accordance with what we think it is. Which leads me to ask, exactly what is justice? Or to put it another way, and I'll leave you with this question, is justice ever done? Thank you.